Welcome to Ecrit Care Podcast. This is our episode number 122. And today I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Joe Shekho. Welcome, Dr. Shekho. Hi, Swapna. Good evening. Good evening. How's things in ICU there? We have been a little bit busy in the last few days, almost full running at full capacity. But it's been okay. Many of them are indeed getting better. So that's good news. That's good. So I think overall, there is some sort of normality has returned within the ICU world after the COVID pandemic. And I think we're back to business as usual in many of the continents. So we're going to dive into another controversy, which we wrote in our book, Controversies in Critical Care, which has received a lot of positive reviews recently. And this controversy has probably under discussed and even underappreciated in the real clinical settings. And the controversy that we are going to dive into today is about diaphragmatic dysfunction in critically ill patients. And just to give a bit of context or a background, majority of the patients who fail to wean from mechanical ventilation in intensive care unit develop critical illness induced polymyopathy or polyneuropathy, or also called as critical illness related weakness. Now, it comes in various different forms and shapes. And majority of the time, we diagnose this entity by looking at their limb power and limb reflexes. But the key inspiratory muscle in the body is the diaphragm. And often we underestimate the weakness of the diaphragm or the diaphragmatic dysfunction in our patients who fail to wean from mechanical ventilation. And it's very well documented that once patients are intubated and ventilated for a prolonged period of time, diaphragm is probably the first muscle to start getting affected. It's one of the largest muscle group of inspiratory system, which is richer in the blood supply. But also, if it remains inactive for a prolonged period of time, it will lead to significant dysfunction. So we are going to understand what's the or what are the, some of the causes of diaphragmatic dysfunction and how do we diagnose it and how do we manage it? So Dr. Jacko, the first and foremost question is, what are the, some of the causes of diaphragmatic dysfunction in critically ill patients? There can be many different causes of diaphragmatic dysfunction in the ICU, in the general critically ill population. One shouldn't forget the common electrolyte abnormalities that might lead to diaphragmatic dysfunction, like, for instance, hypophosphatemia hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia may result in significant diaphragm weakness. Severe hypothyroidism may also result in diaphragm dysfunction and respiratory failure. Prolonged hyperglycemia, severe malnutrition, renal failure, related muscle weakness, all these can lead to diaphragm weakness as well. And then, of course, we know today that too much sedation may not be good. Less is more when it comes to sedating ICU patients. So if the diaphragm is not being used, obviously it will atrophy. Specifically, there may be a dose-related association with proper fall use and diaphragm weakness. Prolonged use of corticosteroids may lead to diaphragm weakness, depending on the duration, the specific agent, and the dose. Neuromuscular blocking agents for long has been associated with disuse atrophy of the diaphragm. And the impact of neuromuscular blockade-associated weakness may be exacerbated with the concomitant use of corticosteroids. And it is also known that the aminosteroid class of neuromuscular blockers, such as vecuronium, may be more prone to cause diaphragm dysfunction compared to the benzyl isoquinolone esters like atracurium and cisatracurium. Ventilator-induced diaphragm dysfunction is one of the other underlying causes. Atrophy and reduction in the contractile force of the diaphragm have been observed within even a few hours of commencement of controlled mechanical ventilation in animal models. Total mechanical activity and controlled ventilation rapidly leads to diaphragm atrophy. And this has been shown in brain-dead organ donors. Within a matter of 18 hours or so, inactivity of the diaphragm 
resulted in marked atrophy, even within such a short period of time. So that's how quickly diaphragmatic myofiber dysfunction and atrophy can occur with no news. Infection and sepsis are the other leading causes of diaphragm dysfunction. In particular, sepsis may be associated with diaphragmatic weakness in more than 50% of mechanically ventilated patients. Besides ischemia to the muscle fibers, in sepsis, you also get inflammatory mediated release, and this may induce detrimental effects on diaphragmatic contractility. The other important cause for unrecognized diaphragm dysfunction in the ICU are the neurological syndromes that may not be very obvious. Patients with a primary neuromyopathic syndrome may occasionally present with hypercapnic respiratory failure. In fact, I remember from one of our cases, there was a gentleman who just wouldn't wean off the ventilator. And then finally, we realized it was myasthenia that was undiagnosed for a long time. So that's something you need to be aware of. Undiagnosed neurological problems may occasionally present with just hypercapnic respiratory failure. And some of the common clinical conditions that may present with hypercapnic respiratory failure include guillain barre syndrome, myasthenia gravis, as I mentioned, hypothyroidism, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and other muscle disorders. So these are some of the common causes that lead to diaphragm dysfunction. The most important point to remember is that you should keep in mind the possibility of diaphragmatic dysfunction as a cause for delayed weaning, difficulty weaning, and actively seek for the underlying cause. That's correct. So whenever you have a patient in front of you who is struggling to wean from mechanical ventilation, even you can use ABCD approach where you rule out issues around airway, breathing, or lung problems, D for cardiovascular, and then D stands for either neurological issues or D also stands for diaphragmatic dysfunction. Unless you have a high index of suspicion, it's very difficult to diagnose diaphragmatic dysfunction. So that leads to the next question that how can we diagnose diaphragmatic dysfunction in critically ill patients? The first and most important thing to remember is to be suspicious, have a high index of suspicion, as you mentioned, for possible diaphragm dysfunction as a cause for delayed weaning or inability to wean. And one of the clinical signs that you would look for is paradoxical respiration. Normally, with inspiration, the chest wall moves outward and the abdomen should also move outward. But if there is significant diaphragm dysfunction, the abdomen, instead of moving outward during inspiration, gets sucked in. And that's paradoxical respiration, which might be an early feature of diaphragm dysfunction. In fact, uh, in India, we get patients who come with organophosphorus poisoning, which leads to dysfunction of the skeletal muscles, diaphragm, and they take a very long time to wean due to intermediate syndrome, as it's called. And typically, we come across this type of paradoxical breathing in these patients with severe diaphragm dysfunction. So, so that's the importance of clinical suspicion. Then, of course, there are definitive modalities of investigation with which you can Check diaphragm function, ultrasonography being one of the bedside modalities of investigation that you can do easily by the bedside. And the, the two parameters that you look for are thickening fraction of the diaphragm and the degree of diaphragmatic excursion. To measure the thickening fraction, what it actually means is that during inspiration, the diaphragm thickens as it contracts. And by looking at the magnitude of thickening will tell you how much is the diaphragm function. So how do you do it in practice? To assess diaphragmatic thickening, you need a high-frequency linear probe, the same probe that you use for central venous line insertion. The probe is placed between the 7th to 9th intercostal spaces and the mid-axillary line, where the diaphragm is viewed in what's called the zone of apposition, where it meets the costal margin laterally. And you can, in this particular spot, you can see it as a three-layered structure with the plural line above 
the peritoneal line below and the muscle layer sandwiched in between. So you look at the diaphragm using this linear probe placed in the mid-axillary line at the zone of apposition. And as your patient inspires, you will see it thicken. You need to make two measurements, the end inspiratory thickness and the end expiratory thickness. The thickening fraction is given by the formula end inspiratory minus end expiratory thickness divided by the end expiratory thickness. So the normal thickening fraction is about 30 to 50 percent. Anything less than 20 percent suggests significant diaphragmatic dysfunction. The other technique is to look at the degree of movement of the diaphragm as it moves down during inspiration. This evaluation is done using a, a low-frequency curvilinear probe. So to measure diaphragmatic excursion, you place a 2 to 5 megahertz probe and you use an anterior subcostal approach on the right side. Probe is placed below the costal margin between the mid-clavicular and mid-axillary lines. The probe marker should point cranially and you see the diaphragm as a curved, thick, hyperechoic line. And during inspiration, it moves down and this movement is measured on the M mode. And any excursion of less than 15 to 20 millimeters during quiet breathing is suggestive of diaphragm dysfunction. So you can use a combination of the thickening fraction and the diaphragmatic excursion ultrasonographically by the bedside, easy to perform to evaluate diaphragm dysfunction. Then there are other techniques as well, which uh, are a little harder to access, not used by many centers. First is the transdiaphragmatic pressure measurement after stimulation of the phrenic nerves in the neck. The principle here is that the transdiaphragmatic pressure is equal to the pleural pressure minus the abdominal pressure. And you use esophageal pressure as a surrogate for the pleural pressure and the gastric pressure as a surrogate for abdominal pressure. So you stimulate the diaphragm and then look at the twitch. Then you figure out the transdiaphragmatic pressure on twitch, which is esophageal pressure minus gastric pressure. A pressure of less than minus 11 centimeters of water represents diaphragmatic dysfunction. So that's another technique which we are not particularly experienced with, although I have come across its use during demo workshops and so on. Then, of course, diaphragmatic electromyography may be used to assess diaphragmatic activity, and that's the methodology that is used with the NAVA mode of ventilation or neurally adjusted ventilatory assist. You need esophageal electrodes which are passed through the nasogastric tube with continuous monitoring of the electrical activity of the diaphragm, or EADI. So regardless of the method used, it is important to be clinically aware of possible diaphragm dysfunction, have a high index of suspicion, and if you feel that there's a strong possibility, you can use ultrasonography by the bedside, easy to perform. Or if you have the access, you can use the transdiaphragmatic pressure measurement or diaphragm EMG. Yeah, that's right. So there are several challenges in diagnosing diaphragmatic dysfunction, especially at the bedside. Often getting the ultrasound on, or having expertise in ultrasound for looking at diaphragmatic dysfunction can be challenging. And also every ICU will not have access to ventilatory modes such as NAVA, which can be then challenging monitor trans diaphragmatic pressures. So having an index of suspicion is important. But the second really important point regarding diaphragmatic dysfunction is, can we prevent it? Yeah, the, one of the most important things to remember, as I mentioned previously, like with any other muscle, misuse or lack of use would result in atrophy sooner or later. And that applies to the diaphragm as well. So the extent of diaphragm atrophy and dysfunction may be reduced by allowing spontaneous respiratory efforts as much as possible during mechanical ventilation. We have had several trials looking through history, including the 
original trial by Cresetel, the ABC trial, the non sida trial, and so on, all of which have focused on allowing patients to breathe spontaneously as much as possible, if the circumstances allow, of course. And maintenance of the contractile activity of the diaphragm has been very well established to preserve diaphragm thickness and function. Patient ventilator synchrony should be particularly uh, focused upon. Any asynchrony should be reduced by using an appropriate modality of ventilation, by titrating the support, and if required, by titrating the dose of sedative agents. In patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome, vigorous spontaneous efforts may worsen lung injuries. So in that particular situation, obviously, you would need deep sedation or even neuromuscular blockade as appropriate. And importantly, once the underlying illness has improved, you should resort to an assisted mode of ventilation, like pressure support ventilation as much as possible, allowing the patient to breathe on their own to the extent possible. And one of the modes that may be helpful in this situation is the nearly adjusted ventilatory assist mode or the NAVA mode. So, so these are some of the techniques that you can use to try to avoid deep sedation, let them wake up, use the diaphragm as much as able, cut down the use of neuromuscular blockers and reduce the use of corticosteroids to the bare minimum. And of course, any electrolyte abnormalities, particularly hypophosphatemia, would require correction. One of the other interventions that often helps in this setting to prevent diaphragmic dysfunction is your regular physiotherapy at the bedside having a access to physiotherapist in the unit who can do twice or thrice a day just physiotherapy for these patients with some inspiratory muscle training. It can be quite useful in these patients who are developing or there are signs they are about to develop diaphragmatic dysfunction. However, unfortunately, sometimes irrespective of how much preventative strategies we use, some patients will end up in developing diaphragmatic dysfunction. So what are the kind of some of the key considerations in terms of management of patients with diaphragmatic dysfunction? So as I mentioned, most importantly, it will be to cut down the duration of sedatives, use muscle relaxants minimally, and correct electrolyte abnormalities, check for hypothyroidism, if that is possible. And there have been some experimental studies with specific therapeutic agents as well, like methylxanthines, which may have a therapeutic role in patients who are difficult to wean, but there is no robust evidence to support its use. Levosimendan has also been tried, found to be useful in improving diaphragm contractility, but clinical studies have not corroborated on these findings. So, so these uh, individual drug therapies are unlikely to be of benefit. Most important will be, as we already discussed, to allow them to breathe on their own as much as possible without taxing them, of course. Use a spontaneous mode as early as possible. Wean off the sedatives and neuromuscular blockade as early as possible and keep a, an eye open for the possibility of diaphragm dysfunction. Diagnose it early using ultrasonography by the bedside, very easy to perform with minimal training. So all these would go a long way in identifying and taking appropriate action. That's right. So I guess managing the diaphragmatic dysfunction can be quite challenging and multimodal approach is always the key uh, in these patients. So thanks, Dr. Chekho, for your time. We'll be back in fortnight's time with another episode. Till then, goodbye and have a nice time. Thanks for listening in. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to eCrit Care Podcast. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, www.critcareedu.com.au to your friends and colleagues. And please leave us a positive review on iTunes. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. Check us out on Facebook at Critical Care Education. Join us next time for another edition of eCrit Care Podcast. <laughs>